Hi, Bobcats. In this video, we're going to take a look at uh, ionic and covalent compounds. We're going to search for a connection between the properties of substances and the type of bonding that's present in those substances, um, as well as see if we can use that to figure out a way to identify the type of bonding based on what we know about the properties of the substance. In this slide, we're looking at a couple of um, different types of solutions. One's known as an electrolyte and one is a non-electrolyte. Um, if you take a compound that is a non-electrolyte and you dissolve it up in water and then you try to pass an electrical current through it, um, they're really boring. If you look at this light bulb in this illustration, nothing happens with a non-electrolyte. However, with an electrolyte, when that compound dissolves, you end up with charged particles in solution, illustrated here by the pluses and minuses. And when you pass electricity through a solution like this, lo and behold, the light bulb lights up. Those charged particles are able to conduct electricity. Another property that we can observe for a substance is its melting point or its boiling point. This particular apparatus that's shown in this uh, photograph is used for measuring the melting point. The sample is placed on this silver sample holder right here, and there's a little uh, magnifying glass that swivels out off of this post to let you look more closely at the sample. And then um, this, this silver sample holder is heated and you control the heating by adjusting this knob. And then you can measure the temperature because this long skinny thing right here is actually a thermometer. And so you can put your sample in here and watch it as you increase the temperature and then record the temperature at which your sample melts when you see it turn from a solid into a liquid. So let's put those two properties together, melting point and electrical conductivity. Those are very different and they are measured in very different ways. Um, this, this table shows the melting point and the conductivity um, of a variety of compounds. The um, melting points range from uh, about 106 Kelvin up to over 1000 Kelvin. Just for reference, room temperature is about 300 on the Kelvin scale. And some of these compounds are electrolytes and conduct electricity in solution, and others are not. On this slide, we're looking at that exact same data, but now we've sorted it from lowest to highest melting point. The um, melting point, or I'm sorry, room temperature roughly divides the data about here. So room temperature again was 300 Kelvin. And notice at that same point, we have a break in conductivity. Uh, things that have melting points below room temperature do not conduct um, electricity when dissolved in solution, and the things that melt above room temperature do. So we're seeing some clustering of properties. Um, things that are electrolytes have low, or, I'm sorry, things that are electrolytes have high melting points. Things that are non-electrolytes have melting points um, that are uh, low. And um, if you look at the elements that make these up, the things that melt at low temperatures are made up of a nonmetal plus another nonmetal, and the ones that uh, melt at the higher temperatures are made up of a metal plus a nonmetal. And then it turns out that those low melting things have covalent bonding, and the high melting compounds have ionic. This table summarizes the properties of the two types of bonding. Um, ionic compounds are made up of a metal plus a nonmetal, where covalent compounds are two nonmetals stuck together. Ionic compounds tend to have very high melting and boiling points, high being referenced to room temperature. And covalent compounds tend to have low melting and boiling points. Um, so this means that ionic compounds are solids at room temperature. Covalent compounds can be 
gases or liquids, or even uh, some of them are solids. So the, the state of matter alone can't distinguish ionic from covalent um, because covalent could be all three states at room temperature. Ionic compounds tend to be very hard and brittle. Some covalent compounds are brittle, but they tend to be fairly weak, or they tend to be soft and waxy like candle wax. Ionic compounds typically dissolve in water, though not always. Um, covalent compounds typically, but not always, won't dissolve in water. Um, ionic compounds will conduct electricity when dissolved in water or a solvent or when they are melted. Um, covalent compounds don't conduct electricity. And for ionic compounds, when that ionic bond gets formed, they are going to transfer electrons from the metal to the nonmetal. And in the case of covalent bonding, the atoms are going to share electrons. Take a moment and see if you can answer this clicker question. It's asking if you have a compound that is a solid at room temperature, it's brittle, and it dissolves in water to make a solution which conducts electricity. What type of compound is it? Is it ionic or is it molecular? You may want to pause this video, see if you can figure out the answer. Okay, so how'd you do? If um, you consider all of the things that are used to describe this compound, the best answer is A, ionic. Um, some of the key points here include um, that the substance conducts electricity. Um, the, it has to have charged particles or ions in order to be able to conduct electricity. Um, most ionic compounds will dissolve in water, so that's another big point. Um, the fact that it's solid at room temperature and brittle also points towards ionic, but could possibly indicate covalent as well. So when you look at all of the data points, this must be ionic. I'd like to take a look at a list of compounds and see if we can identify whether they are ionic or covalent based on the elements that are present. So the first one is ammonia, which is made up of nitrogen and hydrogen. And nitrogen is a nonmetal, and hydrogen is a nonmetal. So when you have a nonmetal plus a nonmetal, that's going to be covalent or molecular. For the next compound, we have cobalt chloride. Cobalt is a metal and chlorine is a nonmetal. So when we have a metal plus a nonmetal, the substance will be ionic. Now I'm going to reveal the remaining compounds. And after I do that, I'd like for you to pause the video and see if you can identify them as ionic or covalent. We have lead oxide, selenium bromide, and nitrogen oxide and manganese dioxide. So pause this video, take a moment, see how these compounds are classified. Okay, let's check and see how you did. Lead is a metal and oxygen is a non-metal. So this next compound is ionic. Selenium is a non-metal and bromine is a non-metal as well. And so this is going to be covalent. Nitrogen and oxygen are both nonmetals. So this compound is covalent. And manganese is a metal where oxygen is a nonmetal. And so this will be ionic. Notice that no matter what compound we're looking at, the second element is always a nonmetal. So the difference really boils down to what type of element is the first element. Also, this is a very practical approach to identifying something as ionic or covalently bonded. Um, we'll look in a later video at something called electronegativity, which is a little bit more theoretical perspective. Um, but the problem with electronegativity is that those values are usually not listed on a periodic table. So um, we tend to like um, ways to classify substances that depend just on the periodic table. Our objectives for this section were to connect 
properties of a substance with its type of bonding, ionic or covalent, um, and even to identify the type of bonding based on the properties that are observed.